It's a city that was born out of fear and desperation to escape invading hordes. It would rise from the water to dazzle the world with its splendor and to shock it with debauchery and executions. How and why did man conquer nature to build Venice? And is it doomed to one day sink beneath the waves? For 1,500 years, it's been the impossible city, standing bravely alone, defying time and tide. Built on the flimsy foundation of tiny, muddy islands, it's surrounded by waters that might easily overwhelm it. Venice is a monument to mankind's will to survive in a struggle against the raw forces of nature. And although man has so far won the struggle, might nature still have the final decisive word? In converting a swampy lagoon into a jewel of Western civilization, the Venetians had to invent a whole new way of life, one that was so well-planned that it's hardly changed from ancient times till today. Unlike most ancient capitals, the city would still be recognizable to former citizens like Marco Polo, who sailed from here in the 1200s on his legendary expedition to China. The early Venetians overcame monumental hurdles. They were forced to find new ways to build, new ways to move about their city, new ways to survive without enough land to grow food. But the Venetians did more than just survive. They built a city that would dominate Europe, commanding an empire of enormous wealth and they built one of the world's first democracies, which they jealously defended with an iron fist. Anyone suspected of undermining the state faced torture and execution. But none of this was in the minds of the first Venetians when they came to the lagoon. They were simply trying to avoid a violent and bloody death on the mainland. During the 400s AD, Italy was a dangerous place to live. It was a target for murderous raiding parties. Barbarian warriors from the north, including the infamous Scourge of God, Attila the Hun, swept through Italy in an orgy of killing and looting that would bring the Roman Empire to its knees. No one suffered more than the residents of northeastern Italy. To escape a brutal fate at the hands of the barbarians, thousands fled to the only refuge they could find, a big swamp near the Adriatic Sea, the Venetian Lagoon. 6,000 years ago, the lagoon was dry land, part of the Italian mainland. But with the end of the Ice Age, water and sediment poured down from the Alps turning this section of the plain into a series of small, muddy islands surrounded by 200 square miles of water. It was never a popular place to live. It was the occasional home to a few fishermen, hunters, and salt producers. It had no fresh water and no land for crops, but that's what made it a good shelter from the barbarians. The invaders could not be bothered chasing the refugees out into the lagoon. At first, the refugees would only stay until each raid was over and then return to the mainland. The first people came out here would never have had the idea that they're going to form a city because there's no building material out here. There's nothing to build with. You have to bring the wood. You have to create a surface that you can stand on or walk on, the, the sort of sediment that forms in the gloom is very sticky. If you walk in it, you sink in it. You can't really easily live out here. But the barbarian raids on the mainland became more frequent. And one Germanic tribe, the Lombards, even decided to stay and colonize northern Italy. And so many Italian mainlanders became Venetians building permanent homes in the lagoon. They were not the Roman-style stone structures they were used to, 
but wooden huts that were light enough not to sink into the muddy marsh. Against the odds, they began to create a community among the reeds and the tides. A visitor's letter from the year 523 describes the scene. You live like seabirds, with your homes dispersed across the surface of the water. Your boats are tied like horses to the doors of your dwellings, opposed to the wildness of the sea. Venice was created out of a sense of, uh, of fear, of uh, desperation, but also I see a lot of uh, self-determination when people that, uh, you know, once they arrive here, they decided, okay, uh, this is better than submitting to the Lombards and we'll stay here. How could Venetians survive in a lagoon that provided no fresh water and no land for growing crops? Necessity decreed that they would have to become traders. It's the only way they could get what they needed to live. And here, the surrounding waters themselves provided the key to riches. Well, there was one positive thing that you could actually do out here. You couldn't drink this water, but the salt in it if you make open salt pans and let it evaporate, you can then actually produce salt. In the ancient world, with no refrigeration, the power of salt to preserve food made it one of the most valuable substances on Earth. Edible gold, it was called. Venetians could now trade for the wealth they needed to turn a swampy settlement of huts into a great city. But money was not enough. How could they build a city on soft mud? Coming up, we'll see how Venetian builders attempted the impossible and managed to pull it off. By the 600s AD, things were only getting worse for the residents of northeastern Italy. They were under the punishing heel of the invading German barbarians, the Lombards. More and more Italians joined the exodus to the Venetian lagoon. Even bishops wanted to move their churches there. But that posed a huge challenge. How could stone churches possibly be built on the soft mud of the islands? Through trial and error, the Venetians searched for a solution finally hit on an idea. If they drove long wooden logs deep into the settlement until they hit firmer earth, then just maybe they could create a foundation to build a church as fine as those on dry land. The big problem they have is the uh, out in the lagoon, there's very soft, spongy sediments. It's very hard. You can't just come out and build a house. You have to create a foundation using some wooden poles and you have to do something like this. I'm gonna push this in, and we're gonna go down into the sediment. You see how quick, soft that is? This is just a piece of plastic, not a piece of wood. And it's going right down, down, down. You can even see the board I'm standing on is going down. And you see that? That's almost four feet. Now the problem is gonna to be to pull it up. So this gives you an idea of just how soft and mucky this sort of sediment is. Undaunted, the Venetians kept refining their new technology. They drove thousands of wooden poles deep into the damp sediment until they hit more solid ground below. They couldn't use metal poles because they'd rust, but wood underwater can last indefinitely. These trunks of wood, while they're under the water and not in contact with air, become increasingly like stone. They petrify, and um, they remain there, and, and they're, they're stronger and stronger and stronger all the time, so they, they don't rot. On top of the poles, the Venetians laid wooden crossbeams to spread the weight of the building. On top of that, 
They laid a foundation made of water-resistant marble. And finally, on top of that, they could start laying the bricks. In the year 639 AD, the builders put their theory into practice, and the result was magnificent. Against all probability, they had managed to build a cathedral on mud on the island of Torcello. With this building, the Venetians had done more than build the church. They had announced to the world that the lagoon was their permanent home. All this meant that they were determined to stay. Torcello is, in a way, the, the beginning of, uh, of uh, settling down in the lagoon. And this will be a very long and gradual process uh, which will transform barren mud flats into a one, the wonderful city that we can experience today. It was, you know, like the first step. The Torcello Cathedral showed that the Venetians were brilliant improvisers in more ways than one. Having no building materials of their own, they literally carried their bishop's old church from the mainland out into the lagoon. The big problem is where do you get enough bricks to make this thing, the materials again? And what they will probably do initially when they built that first church, they will bring the bricks over from the old church. They will disassemble, put on boats, and bring four miles out here into the lagoon, the old church. The daring project was not an immediate success. Archaeologists have found that the church was rebuilt several times in its early life. Those first builders may have discovered the problem that still threatens Venice today. Subsidence, the tendency for the muddy land to sink lower in the water. Dramatic evidence of the problem can be seen with bell towers all over the lagoon. They lean because the mud beneath them varies in firmness, so that two sides of a building can sink at different rates. With the Venetians now erecting buildings that reflected their wealth from the salt trade, the lagoon's fame began to grow. Now, ironically, it became a place worth invading. The first to try was Pepin, the king of the Franks in 810. But although they had the stronger army, the Franks did not have the sailing skills necessary to fight in this strange environment. The Franks had also come up against a danger in the lagoon that would plague Venetians themselves for centuries. Malaria. Many Franks were struck down, and their king, Pepin, was dead within weeks of their retreat. But even though the Venetians had survived the invasion, they made radical changes to defend themselves against future attacks. In the early 800s, they created a new capital on a group of largely deserted islands in the middle of the lagoon, which were protected by more than two miles of water on all sides. The new settlement was called the Rialto and would become the heart of modern Venice. One huge advantage of the new capital was the natural water channels that ran right through it, including the Grand Canal, perfect for Venetian trading boats. The natural canals and others made by hand would become the streets of their city. Many of them are the very old ones, like the Grand Canal where we are right now. We can see on maps going back, but we know in many other places where there's very straight canals, that go on lines, they artificially straightened them out and made long ones which were good for commercial things so that supplies could be brought in. They probably just would dam it up with wood on the end and then you know, just dig it out with shovels and so forth. Probably very simple, basic technology. One of the first things Venetians wanted for their new capital was respect. And they soon found a way to get the world's attention. Around the year 829, according to legend, two Venetian merchants were sent to Alexandria in Egypt, where the evangelist Saint Mark was buried. They bribed the guardians of the shrine to give them the body. The merchants then carried it to their ship and covered it with pork to avoid the Muslim officials. 
and sailed it triumphantly to Venice. The Venetians had barely settled on their new capital, the Rialto Islands, when they had to build a resting place worthy of their patron saint, Mark the Evangelist, recently stolen from Egypt. What they built was St. Mark's Basilica, one of the world's great churches. It was begun in the 830s and rebuilt over the next two centuries. Recent scientific work has shown exactly what the Venetians were up against when they attempted such a huge project. Core samples of the soil around the basilica showed that the ancient builders had to drive their foundation poles down more than 15 feet until they found the level where the soft mud changes into firm, compacted sand. Now, the important thing is if you're going to build a big building like the Basilica of St. Mark's here, if you can get your wooden poles to go all the way through these sediments down to the top of the sands, which you see here, this is much more resistant. It holds the poles much better. Where if your poles are still in this kind of soft sediment, it has less ability to carry a big weight. What we can now see in retrospect is the Venetians were very lucky to build their big buildings on this sort of island of sand. The Basilica ushered in an age of wondrous building in Venice that would captivate the world to the present day. This would be a city built on a petrified forest. Some buildings needed more than a million wooden poles beneath them to prevent them from sinking beneath the water. So brilliant were the early Venetians in devising a way to defy nature with their monumental structures that some have lasted more than a thousand years. And to this day, the basic method has not changed. Wooden poles are still used for foundations, although now it's machines instead of men that supply the power. Venetian architects became so bold in their battle with the environment that they began building palatial houses right in the canals themselves, facing the tides. And that was because uh, the owners were merchants. And their residence was their home, but it was also the place where they conducted business. So it was very easy for the boats coming back from the east with the merchandise to stop near the palace and to load and unload the merchandise. The floor at sea level was the warehouse. The living quarters were upstairs. These canal palaces were able to survive the damp because the brick foundation was reinforced with a special waterproof material Venetian merchants had discovered on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. History and marble. So that was stone that had to be imported all the way uh, to Venice, to the lagoon. And this is a stone uh, which is very resistant. Uh, it doesn't perish very easily. Uh, the Venetians understood that. And uh, it could take the lapping of water without much damage. And in fact, it's still there. While the rest of Europe in the Middle Ages was fearfully building castles for protection, the Venetians were building open-fronted palaces, anxious to display their wealth. The Venetians had come to this lagoon for refuge, and surrounded by its waters, they still felt safe. It was another reason, too, for their showy confidence. They had begun using their mastery of the water to create an empire that would dominate Western civilization. From the time they first fled into the lagoon, the Venetians were forced to become master boatmen. It was the only way they could get around the lagoon, and they also had to trade far and wide to survive. Then, as now, every aspect of life was dominated by the water. Horses were never allowed, and today cars are banned. In Venice, everything goes by boat, from deliveries of life's necessities to emergency services, 
to business commuters. The early Venetians were as inventive in designing their boats as they were with churches and palaces. More than a thousand years ago, they invented a new type of boat for gliding over the shallow canals. The gondola is built with a slim hull and a flat underside and is skewed to make it maneuverable in even the narrowest places. But it was ocean-going ships that would change the destiny of Venice. Fate had forced them to trade for their livelihood, so they turned necessity into a virtue. They would become the greatest traders in the world. It's very logical in a way because Venice is in the water, so the people were boat people, you know, they were experienced uh, in seafaring, so they devoted all their energies to, uh, to trading and they became uh, a very uh, powerful and wealthy merchants. Venice built the greatest ocean going fleet in the world. Their shipyard, called the Arsenal, began turning out ships at the rate of one a day. By the 1300s, nearly 3,000 ships were sailing under the Venetian flag. Venice was dominating European trade, selling their salt and importing luxury goods from the east to resell to the west. Popular items sold included spices, silk, and pearls. The Venetian coin, think of it like the American dollar today. They have found Venetian coins ch in China, all over. Um, it, it, was, it was really the, the leading currency for centuries. Venice's fortunes were so closely linked to the sea that the two were literally married. Every year, the Venetian ruler, the Doge, would throw a golden ring into the sea with the words, we wed thee, O sea, in token of our true and lasting dominion. Venetian merchants were famous for their adventurous spirit. One of them, Marco Polo, made it all the way to China in the late 1200s. And according to legend, brought home a new type of cooking Italians had not seen before, pasta. Marco Polo set European minds racing with his tales of the rich exotic East inspiring another Italian to find a new way of reaching China by sea. His name was Christopher Columbus. Venetian ships were not designed purely for trade, however. They were also designed for war. They were great fighting forces, and uh, the merchant families were expected to raise a, a crew and uh, take out a galley to fight in the various wars. And they had great ambitions always for merchant uh, activity and to defend those routes and their commerce and to get the best trading conditions, they were ready to fight for it. Many of Venice's sea battles were fought to defend its trade empire. But Venice could also go on the attack. In 1202, Europe's Christian crusaders needed ships for their mission to win Jerusalem back from the Muslims. Venice let them rent its fleet. But seeing a chance for more earthly rewards, the Venetians steered the fleet to Constantinople, which today is Istanbul in Turkey. Then it was the richest city in the known world and the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. The Venetians helped to overrun and loot the city hauling huge quantities of gold, marble, art, and holy relics back to Venice itself. Venice had shown it would do whatever it took to expand its wealth. And as we'll see, the city could be just as ruthless at home, where opposition was met with torture and execution. Building a city in the water created a huge challenge for the Venetians. It also gave them some unique advantages. The water protected Venetians from mainland Europe and turned them into the world's greatest sailors, the key to their wealth. 
But the isolation by water brought more subtle benefits too. Because they were huddled together on a few small islands, the Venetians developed a fierce communal pride in their city. In fact, every trading ship was commanded to bring back riches to increase the splendor of St. Mark's Basilica. The sense of shared destiny meant that unlike most of medieval Europe, which was living under kings and warlords, Venice developed its own brand of democracy. A grand council of 2,000 members, rich and poor, would elect the city's leader, the Doge, and power was shared among them. It's a system that would be adapted centuries later by a country then unknown. There was a tremendous attention on things that actually Americans used when they um, developed their government of things that we would call like checks and balances. There was um, great attention to never let any single person or single family to become too powerful. Venetians were almost paranoid in their desire to prevent anyone from overriding or undermining their system. A special box called a lion's mouth was set up so that citizens could leave anonymous letters detailing alleged plots by their neighbors. Those found guilty faced a horrible prospect. Venetian prisons were infamous for their instruments of torture, including those for tearing out teeth and tongues and for crushing skulls. There were many um, people sort of put to death for uh, infringing anything that might harm the Republic. They had their spies everywhere, of course, um, they, and anybody who might uh, be suspected of uh, acting for some foreign power would certainly be arrested and thrown into the prisons and tortured and uh, hanged on the uh, piazza there between the two columns. There was, there was no, uh, uh, no mercy at all. They were very uh, cruel at the time. In the 1400s, a Frenchman was hanged in the square outside the Doge's palace, simply for having been overheard to say that he would like to wash his hands in Venetian blood. No one was immune, including the head of government. In 1355, a Doge named Marin Fallier, a hot-tempered man in his 70s, was infuriated when a young nobleman accused Fallier's wife of cheating on him. In revenge, Fallier plotted with others to massacre all the young nobility and to have himself made Prince of Venice. The plot was uncovered, Fallier himself was quickly beheaded, and his body dumped in an unmarked grave. But despite its merciless treatment of conspirators, the Venetian government was not a reign of terror. Its republic lasted more than a thousand years because Venetians supported it. There was never a single uprising. The Venetian state provided welfare measures unheard of elsewhere. From the 1300s, Venice provided doctors for a state-run medical service and also gave the poor free legal representation. Venice's wealth was used to support not just the poor, but great artists too. The fact that these Venetian merchants became wealthy and wealthier and then even more wealthy meant that they had money to spend on things that were not essential. And art is one of those things. Venice gave the world some of its greatest artists, including painters like Titian and Bellini, and composers like Vivaldi and Monteverdi. Thousands of miles away, unseen by Venetians, the seeds of their empire's destruction were being sown. Venice had dominated ocean trade for centuries, but in 1492, Italian Christopher Columbus, on a mission for Spain, discovered the Americas, opening a whole new world of trade for Europe. Only a few years later, the Portuguese found a new way to Asia, sailing around Africa's Cape of Good Hope. Venice's age of dominance was over. 
Venice's ships were built to deal with the Mediterranean waters, the small round ships. There was just this problem that Venice's ships were outmoded and couldn't deal with the, with the rougher waters of the new trade routes. Closer to home, Venice was being challenged by the new Turkish Empire, and a series of bloody battles left Venice badly weakened. By the 16 and 1700s, Venice had become famous not for its power, but its decadence. As its role on the world stage grew less and less important, Venice became a pleasure capital, with many citizens squandering the fortunes their families had built up over centuries. Gambling became an uncontrollable citywide craze. Gaming tables were found in noblemen's houses, barber shops, coffee houses, and were even set up in the main square. Many women were said to be such compulsive gamblers that they would give themselves to anyone who would give them the chance to play. Venice was also full of ladies of pleasure. Courtesans was the name they used. One English writer estimated there were 20,000 courtesans in Venice. The city became known as the brothel of Europe, and wealthy young European men would go there as part of their education. The city's reputation was made even more infamous by the Venetian ladies' man Casanova, who was jailed in the 1750s for outrages against the holy religion. Casanova published a book exaggerating his conquests and wrote that in Venice, the nuns made the most exciting lovers and that there was not one in the city who couldn't be had for money. Venice's decadence would spell the demise of the region as an independent state. Finally, in 1797, the French army under Napoleon Bonaparte marched into the city unopposed. After a thousand years, the Republic had become a colony. Venice remained in foreign hands until it became part of a unified Italy in 1870. But Venice's oldest foe had still not been overcome. Its struggle against nature was still being fought. Coming up, we'll find answers to the questions that have haunted Venice throughout history. Is the city sinking, and can it survive? For 1,500 years, the city in the sea has been winning its battle against nature, the triumph of human ingenuity over a hostile environment. But in 1966, Mother Nature let Venice know that the battle is not yet over. A huge tide swept in, putting Venice six feet below sea level and causing millions of dollars of damage. As the lagoon and the canals overflowed, no corner of the city was spared. It meant that the ground floors were already absolutely water sodden, and the salt water got into the brickwork, which is the core of the walls, and goes on climbing up. It's, it's got in there now. It'll go on working in the walls for years, and that produces salt crystals, which gradually disintegrate the bricks. It was a stunning reminder of a fact that Venetians had known for centuries, but had chosen to ignore, that the city is inevitably sinking. From the day that any building goes up, it starts to sink, slowly but surely, because the sediment beneath it is settling lower in the lagoon. To make things worse, the world's sea level has been slowly rising for centuries, a potential disaster for a city built at sea level. Together, the two factors mean that Venice has been sinking about four to five inches every century since it was founded. In older buildings on the canals, the water has now risen above the layer of the waterproof marble. The city has sunk a bit, and then you have to take into consideration the rising of the sea level as well. So now the water is lapping onto 
the bricks, which are on top of the stones, and then you get a lot of damage. But this is something that the Venetians couldn't anticipate, of course. One Venetian palace which graphically shows the problem is the Caramosto, built 750 years ago. The sediment underneath is sinking unevenly, so that the palace now tilts to the right. But the bigger problem is that when the high tide comes in, as it does twice every day, water covers the original loading platform and the bases of the columns, which should be well above the water line. The situation has really changed dramatically. These are the original columns. And as we see, they're actually in the water. This was the deck where you unloaded your merchandise, your wool, your various spices, all of these things. And that surface there would have been two to three feet above the water level. So what we can see is the sinking of this over the last 750 years has led to it actually going down almost three feet. The sinking is threatening to eat away parts of Venice's most famous building of all. Inside St. Mark's Basilica is one of the lowest points in Venice. Walk down some stairs and you're inside the original crypt where the saint was first laid to rest nearly 1,200 years ago. Now he rests upstairs, away from the basement crypt where gushing waters have intruded in recent centuries. The crypt room was originally built three feet above sea level, but now it's a foot below and vulnerable. Flooding of a foot or two has been common, and in 1966, water poured down the stairs and filled the entire room. The crypt was completely invaded by the floodwaters. The only parts left untouched were a few air pockets at the top. It took about a month to empty the crypt and clean it out. Even in normal times, water seeps in from the surrounding canals, leaving the walls caked in salt, which eats the bricks, a problem that affects the whole city. Even after the restoration, you find that the salt keeps seeping out of the wall, as you can clearly see. The salt really hurts the bricks, making them brittle and easy to break. But not all of Venice's problems are caused by nature. Many of them are created by the Venetians themselves. In the canals, the engines of modern boats are undermining the foundations of the buildings. The propeller creates the most damaging kind of vortex underneath in the water and therefore damaging whatever foundation it's, it's near to. In quite a number of places, they've had to repair the foundations there uh, because of that continuing uh, erosion by the action of the propellers of the boats. Man's interference has even accelerated the sinking of the whole city. For much of this century, the lagoon floor was pumped to provide water and gas for industry. That alone caused the city to sink an extra couple of inches until the pumping was stopped in the 1970s. But even so, the natural sinking of Venice continues. If some kind of solution is not found, Venice will gradually disappear. Throughout their history, the answer Venetians have come up with is simply to keep one step ahead of the water by building up the ground level with landfill. Archaeologists digging beneath St. Mark's Square have found that it has been built up nearly 10 feet since the first settlement over a thousand years ago. Because of the sinking of Venice and also certain changes and so forth, they had to build up the land. And what we see in these boxes, in this core, in this several feet of sediments is actually that sequence of getting the land surface up to a higher height to keep above the water. Here's a good example of an archaeological find which is occurring. This is about four and a half feet 
and we can see this is a piece of tile, which is actually bigger than I thought. It's very big. Look at that. This is part of probably a roof tile, which has been thrown in as probably fill. But landfill can't go on forever because the ground floors of buildings would be covered up. So now, a different solution is being discussed. Plans have been drawn up for huge floodgates to be put at the mouth of the lagoon to stop dangerously high tides from coming in. The problem is that Venice, as a living city, depends on the tides to wash the canals each day. The tides are literally the sewage removal system. Even with the tides, the canals often have to be drained and scraped out. Walling out the sea would be swapping one problem for another. Some experts now describe Venice as being like a sick patient, constantly revived, but never really cured. If Venice continues to sink about six inches per century, then the city will reach the point where the sea level is much higher than the city itself. Therefore, we will have to create some kind of basin where the water level in the city is lower than the surrounding sea. That's something for future scientists. It's a very tough problem. But whatever they do, do the Venetians really have any say in the ultimate fate of their city? Scientists say that with global warming, the world's ice regions are melting so fast that the sea level in the future might rise more quickly than ever, maybe as much as one whole foot in the next century. Over the next thousand years, there are catastrophic predictions that the seas might rise 50 to 100 feet. That would obliterate hundreds of world cities. Venice would simply be one of the first to disappear. Eventually, the city that seemed impossible to build may prove impossible to save.